much for my LSE. Thank you for coming. While studying Brazilian cities, uh, which as many, perhaps most cities in the global south, are divided, divided cities. And the problem is how movement or dislocation of mind and body in space shapes thinking and self-understanding for individuals and communities. And how this in turn is defined by the kinds of cities in which they live. And in the context of this conference, we might also want to think how this can define uh, what a good city is, or uh, how this defines the city in turn. So we approach this problem by focusing on porosity of city borders. That's what our ESSC project is about at the level of the city. So you can see here, in one of the communities we study in Rio, how the problem of dislocation in space uh, can take place. Uh, into this problem, we integrate the subjective level of individuals and communities. This is another view from Santa Marta, another of the communities we study in Rio, where you can see the kinds of borders that are involved in the dislocations people face every day when they move around the city. So the research map we have been developing uh, looks a bit like this. We look at the city scale, considering porosity of borders, and I'll say something about that in a moment, which can be high, medium, or low, in relation to both individual resilience and community resilience, which we operationalize and consider through the perceptions and imaginations that people have about their city and neighborhoods, the wider social representations and knowledge that cities hold about themselves and the specific areas of town, of a town, and the manner in which place interacts with cognitive and affective understandings of self and others, as well as the life one should or could live. And that's especially important for young people living in favela territories where life trajectories, potential selves, and development pathways are usually defined from without by the very adverse contextual situation in which they find themselves. We also investigate the role of agency at a collective level, uh, how does communities produce a form of social experience that can appear as NGOs, social movements, artistic organizations in very hybrid, multiple forms uh, that are very, very focused on acting on urban frontiers, trying to establish communication between favela territories and the wider public sphere of the city, and they, I can't talk about, uh, I don't have the time to talk about this, but they are incredibly creative and innovative in the way they do that. So we look at this different levels in relation to what we call porosity of city borders, how open or close neighborhoods are in relation to the wider sphere of the city. So a central, uh, this is something, um, that you can see, I want to make this very concrete. Uh, this dimensions are very easily identified in some of the urban voices that we have worked with in Rio, such as the ones from this young people from City of God and Cantaga Cantagalo uh, favelas in Rio. So for instance, a very young man in Cantagalo says, here what happens is this, not in the hill, but in the asphalt, which is the way the division between the favela and the city is, uh, is spoken about in Rio. They talk about the favela as the hill and the asphalt as the city. They look at you, oh, you are off the hill, 
without shame, they hide their backs. They pretend that they are talking to someone behind you. Hi there, they say, just across the street. Without any shame, they run away with fear. Uh, a young girl I interviewed in City of God, Cidade de Deus, uh, said to me something that was very striking right at the beginning of this research. I don't go out of City of God to Barra, to Recreio. But I think that if I did, I would have had a lot of discrimination for being black. It would end up happening. Has this ever happened? No. And you fear that this would happen? She says, no, not fear, but shame. Why? Why do you think this happened? Ah, because of me being, my being black, being poor. So a central question to us is to ask, how can this girl, this beautiful, absolutely beautiful girl, how can is she escape from her situation? As she grows up, she can forge a route. Can she forge a route to escape the damage uh, to her sense of herself and her relation to others and to the wider city? Increasing porosity of city borders is a possible answer to this question, which immediately makes the study of porous or open city relevant. So in my paper today, I want to argue that ferocity of city borders should be a central value and a central aim for building a good city. <coughs> Open cities are enablers of communication between people, experiences, ideas across neighborhoods and ge geographies. Poor cities enable communication in multiple ways, one that, and especially, I think one of the things uh, we discovered working uh, in Rio is that the more open uh, neighborhoods and, and uh, territories are, the more the city is able to imagine its internal differences as something that is more than a threat, as something that actually can produce very positive sociability that can take us back to what was yesterday referred as the pleasure principle to rediscover the city as a space of pleasure, as a space of positive sociability, as a space for discovering, for crossing the, and exchanges. So I will start by saying something about ferocity of borders and about the indicators we consider that are relevant for diagnosing them. And very briefly, I will indicate how this affects psychological dimensions of human development, both individual and social. So. Uh, how to define ferocity of borders? You know, we, part of the project was conduct a systematic review of this literature, and the key finding is that there is virtually nothing written about ferocity of city borders. We couldn't find anything, but we found a great deal of research on the issue of borders and boundaries, and that's our conceptual starting point. Uh, boundaries and borders in cities, they can be material, they can be ethnic, they can be religious, moral, they can be class-based, they can be institutional borders, they can be symbolic. And we found this research operating slightly independent. So people would consider these borders in their own right. So for the purposes of what we're doing, we uh, con conflated them in three dimensions that we consider, uh, that we call physical and spatial borders, symbolic borders and socio-institutional borders. Uh, and from those three dimensions, we try to find, uh, you know, this is a bit a description of what they are, but I'm going to, to move on from that. Uh, perhaps I should say something about the symbolic elements of borders, because they are especially relevant for the psychosocial approach that we try to contribute here. Uh, to the urban transformations discussions. When we speak about symbolic elements, we're talking about knowledge-based conceptual <coughs> distinctions made by social actors to categorize objects, peoples, practices, and even time and space. They are able to separate people into groups and generate feelings of similarity and group membership. And they are incredibly important when it comes to understand the kind of local knowledges and understandings that define how people navigate space in the city. 
But from these three uh, dimensions, we have built some indicators that then we are able to study empirically in neighborhoods. This has to do with institutions, their number, their type, and diversity. So just to give you an idea, in the favelas, the institutional framework is characterized by a really strong complexity, despite there being very, very few institutions in favela life. Uh, the ones we found where the narco gangs, the narco traffic actually regulates and organizes favela life more than any other institution. Uh, the family is an important institution. The churches and the NGOs I was talking about, this organized social movements that sometimes are the only face of some kind of positive intervention to favela territories use. So we look at institutions, who, who they are, what how many are there, how diverse they are. We look at location in the city in terms of, is it remote, is it easy or difficult to gain access to, which directly operationalize the right to go, the, the right to come and go in the city. We look at urban connectors, lifts, parks, centers. In Rio, it has been incredibly important that the complex of Dualemon favela, for instance, has been connected to the wider city via funicular that has completely transformed the way people in complex of Dualemon move around the town. We look at the social representations, the tacit knowledges, the understandings people have about specific parts of town and about themselves, and whether there's a positive or negative, and we look at uh, about how people have pleasure in the city, how people enjoy themselves if they do that inside their communities or outside their communities. So these are the kinds of uh, indicators. And we have to use this model to compare different cities in Brazil, Fortaleza, Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, Porto Alegre. My students have used this model to look at London, to look at Caracas, to look at different towns as well, and to give you an idea of what we found in Rio, for instance, I just want to emphasize Cantagallo and Vigara Geral because they are very, very, they are at the, at the extremes of this continuous. In Cantagallo, you find a very, very, um, uh, let me start with Vigara Geral actually at the end, okay, which is at the end of the spectrum, very, very close borders, which are in contrast. Uh, in Cantagallo, you basically need to request permission Sorry, in Vigara Geral, you need to request permission to go in. The drug trade authorizes your entrance into that territory. You can see here that to get, that's how you get into Cantagallo through that bridge, and that's uh, the researchers were walking there. Uh, there is someone actually at the border. Uh, as you can see, they use guns very explicitly to control the territorial border. And uh, the institutions in Vigado are extremely limited. Apart from those NGOs that work there and uh, local churches, the state is only present through the police and nowadays the army. There is no other presence of the state. There is no other institution. Moreover, there are incredibly negative representations of Vigara Geral in the city. People think of it as a Rio de Janeiro Gaza Strip. So it's something that prevents mobility, prevents people going in and going out. Uh, at the same time, and interestingly enough, uh, you find this cultural center inside Vigara Geral, and that's in that, that cultural center, this cultural center was constructed by Arthur Hege, which is one of the NGOs that operates there. It's a state-of-the-art cultural center. For those of you who know Brazilian music, Caetano Veloso, Chico Buarque have played in uh, the cultural center. Madonna has played in the cultural center. So this is one of the ways in which new social agents have to bring the city into the community. And the name of this cultural center is quite mind-blowing because it's called Cent Cultural Center Vali Salomão, who is one of the big names of Brazilian Tropicalia and is a hero for many of the favela activists who theorize the problem of hybridity in Brazilian culture, of mixture, of 
communication across difference and across racial background. So they really make a very huge statement, as you can see here at the center, uh, seen from the, I find this a very striking urban image in a way, to have that fist uh, in the middle of a very remote favela in Rio. Now, Cantagallo is very, very different at the other end of this continuum because you are going to see this is a self-portrait of Cantagallo favela that hangs right at the entrance of the community. They are very, very different because they are right in the middle of the city. You just need to go down or take the lift to be, to be in Copacabana or to be in Ipanema. They enjoy all the facilities of the surroundings and they can really communicate with the city in very different ways. So this is to exemplify to you what we're calling porosity of city borders and how we're trying to measure them. Now, we have linked this level of uh, our research with the subjective psychological level and with indicators of human development. So what is striking for us is that we found a very clear association between movement and dislocations in the city and the expansion of self-esteem, the expansion of cognitive abilities in children and teenagers, the expansion of relational networks, the kinds of people and horizons young children and teenagers engage with. And we found that the more these communities rely on the NGOs that they themselves construct, the more closed, the, the more they do not have access to what the state should be providing. So the, the role of these agencies, these NGOs operating in these territories is incredibly important and needs to be paid attention to because they are the only face of some kind of agency that can connect to the state, that can be scaled, can, that the state can, state can learn from and uh, have their projects scaled up. So, um, you know, that's basically what I wanted to say. I have a very small film that is two minutes. I don't know if I can show that because I think it's the best way to describe what people have to say about the favelas and what I was telling you. Yeah. So if you allow me, I will. At the cost of some questions in the end. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, oops. Uh, yeah, so I need to find this here. Não acredito que algum ser soberano fez a opção de destinar pessoas a viverem pior ou melhor. A vela é uma única. Meu mundo, meu lugar, tá entendendo? Onde tem as minhas raízes, né? Eu nasci, me criei, onde eu aprendi os meus valores e os não valores. A verdade é essa. Antes a única coisa que eu chegava na favela era a violência, né? O modo como a violência afetava a minha vida. E hoje eu consigo enxergar outras coisas que não a violência. Uh, o filme tem um lema que é transformar aquilo que era em estigma em carisma. Não é falar de um outro lugar, é continuar falando daquele mesmo lugar que sempre foi marginalizado, foi vendo, mas só com um olhar diferente. Aqui é o ponto mais alto. Esse ponto aqui é o mais alto, hoje que é 50 é que mede. Antigamente eu também não tinha perfil, eu era aquele moleque solto, independente de eu estar estudando, de eu estar batalhando para ser alguém na vida. Depois de um tempo, né, eu, fui, eu entrei para o Afro Reggae e comecei a fazer as coisas, me começou a mostrar um mundo totalmente diferente. É o que a gente está vivendo aqui, você está aqui hoje na favela e ali é Ipanema, ou seja, assim, esse, o PIB, parte do PIB do nosso estado, são pessoas que moram nessa região aqui. Né? E um dos menores de DH são pessoas que moram exatamente aqui onde a gente está de pé. Mas eu acho que tem que mudar, a gente tem que incomodar todo mundo, quem mora aqui e quem mora ali.
consigo me imaginar fora da Frag, não. Porque foi através da Frag que eu vi o mundo lá fora, que eu não vi que o mundo só tem aqui mesmo da comunidade, entendeu? Acho que isso pode ser reproduzido. Acho que essa força de vontade pode ser reproduzida em qualquer lugar do mundo. Eu acho que o impacto maior, primeiro, é o trabalho com autoestima, né? Saber que eu tenho capacidade de crescer e que um morador de favela tem a capacidade de construir coisas e modificar. Você ter a consciência de cidadão dentro da sociedade um todo, mas sempre olhar para o lugar que você veio, para o lugar que você está, que você se desperta para a necessidade do mundo, mas parte dali. Todo desejo, esse desejo, toda essa vontade de mudança, parte ali dentro. from favelas to uh, smart cities, so uh, hold, hold, on to your, hold on to your hats. Um, so I'm a, a PI of an ESRC funded project on um, Milton Keynes' smart city, actually, uh, but this paper is generated by some just kind of general, it's a kind of byproduct of, of the project, um, which as I was reading around smart cities and going to smart city events and so on, um, started to strike me that imagination uh, has quite a complicated role in relation to discourses of the smart city. Uh, so I've, I've put together uh, uh, this talk around, uh, around that problematic. Uh, so, uh, I guess I probably don't need to say this to this audience, but just in case, um, smart, uh, smart cities, uh, smart technologies, um, smart cities ha uh, are have saturated with smart technologies that generate uh, and analyze big urban data. And they're one of the major ways uh, in which urban transformations are being planned right now. Um, but there's also uh, huge amounts of imagination, imaginary work going on around that tech to make, to make sense of it. It's being made meaningful, it's narrated, it's visualized uh, in, in really particular kinds of ways. Uh, the large software companies who sell smart city technologies are putting huge amounts of work, actually surprising amounts, uh, if they're so evidently good, quite why they need to advertise them so heavily is, uh, is an interesting question, um, but they are putting lots of work into um, uh, explaining, uh, selling, creating their own uh, smart imaginaries on their YouTube channels, in television adverts, uh, through their Twitter feeds, uh, and at expos. Uh, indeed, Siemens uh, has built a whole uh, exhibition space uh, in London Docklands um, on uh, sustainable urbanism, uh, which for them is, is smart. Uh, and of course, for many city leaders, uh, their rankings in, in um, kind of, uh, smart city league tables uh, are really important, and it matters to them that when we think of Amsterdam or Barcelona or Soldo, uh, that, that we think of them also as, as, smart, as smart cities. Now, some of the work I've been doing is thinking a bit more carefully about how these smart cities are, are imagined, what kind of content of these visualizations and so on might, might signify. I'm happy to say a little bit more about that, perhaps in discussion. Um, but what I'm more interested in just thinking a bit more about, given the topic of this round table, is the role of imagination itself. Imagination as a, as a process, a thing, a concept, a, a place we will find, uh, um, uh, and how that is, is being positioned in relation to, uh, to smart, which I think is important given that um, yes, so smart is being pitched as, as one of the main ways in which it is going to be transforming uh, into the future. And I think uh, it strikes me that um, in relation to smart cities uh, and the imagination, smart uh, seems to be um, uh, to suffer either from too much imagination or uh, uh, has a kind of deficit of imagination. So let me uh, explain what I mean by that. And I'm going to start off by thinking about humans before moving on to the city itself. So humans, uh, it seems, in smart cities uh, are either not being imaginative enough or uh, they're being uh, far too imaginative. So for example, uh, and I won't go through all the references here, but a lot of this is drawn from literatures, especially critical social science literatures about smart cities. Uh, uh, in, uh, people in smart cities, they or we, or, or lots of us anyway, uh, are unaware that our data is being um, uh, more and more untethered from its provenance, 
uh, reducing our ability to interrogate it, for example. Uh, apparently, we choose to consent to terms and conditions without ever thinking about their consequences. I, I wrote this uh, a little while ago. I think perhaps events in recent weeks <laughs> may need a little more um, uh, modification of, of, of this kind of account. Um, but you'll hear uh, critical uh, essays talking about how we choose um, to thoughtlessly hand our decision-making over to corporations and their machines. Adam Greenfield argues this at length. Um, uh, Mark Graham suggests we've been acting a general lack of awareness. Uh, so it seems that few of us are peering beyond our smartphone screens to imagine the chains of code and data in which uh, uh, smart tech is embedded. So in short, we, the users of the smart city, if you like, the residents, aren't imagining it properly. We're not being imaginative enough about it. On the other hand, uh, many of those then critics would argue that the marketeers of smart city uh, and, and its hype, um, uh, they're accused of having way too much imagination. All those beautiful computer-generated images of computer-generated cities uh, in which data flows endlessly and smoothly through the air, uh, inhabitants have nothing better to do than, than linger around in the sunshine, uh, looking at screens in their perfectly efficient and coordinated lives. The cities always look clean and new, and the only problems that are ever made visible are the ones that data indeed can itself solve. So all this is ridiculous, the critics say, and of course they're right. Uh, and it's nothing what, lo like what smart cities might actually uh, do or be like. But again, the criticism is that smart cities are not being imagined um, properly. There isn't a proper relation to uh, the imagination. Smart is deemed to be too imaginary, too spectacular, too ridiculous. The ambitions it articulates are so extreme that they become little more than a fantasy, to quote uh, Ori Halpern, utterly untethered from any reality. So where does this kind of problematic thing going on with imagination and smart come from? Um, well, I did something that I always tell students not to do, which is that I went to the Oxford English Dictionary to look at the, uh, the definition of imagine, imagination. Um, and it's actually quite a, it's an, an interesting one. Um, the OED points out that vernacular definitions of imagination focus on the mind as an inner space uh, where thoughts, images, and ideas are produced and stored. Uh, which then uh, draws out, uh, draws on external experiences and imaginatively uh, reworks them. So the everyday understanding of imagination then makes a distinction between the inner imagination and outer experiences. Now, if you look at most academic discussions, particularly around the urban imaginary, um, I think they do something very similar. Certainly, the kind of standard text that, that, that began that, that now it's very rich and extensive literature on urban imaginaries. They all kind of assume that imagination is a process which is tethered to uh, human dwellers, human bodies, uh, human thought. It's an aspect of distinctively human uh, interiority. So uh, Andreas Heisen, in one of the key texts on urban imaginaries, talks about the way the city, city dwellers imagine their own city uh, uh, with, a, um, with a situated and city-centric consciousness. Um, uh, that's Ed Soja. Tony King talks about what's referred to as the city exists only in our heads. Um, so which again talks about mental and cognitive mappings uh, and certainly the urban imaginary of smart cities has been described as a smart mentality again this kind of human inter interiority uh, as part of, of what the urban imaginary might be distinct from what is out there in the world buildings uh, or data so this then allows uh, a particular connotation of the word imaginary to emerge namely that the inner imaginary doesn't uh, correspond adequately to, to the outside world um, imagination, and notes the OED, um, uh, <coughs> more than once, might include a fanciful project, uh, which can be a quality of genius, it says, but it can also be deluded, or indeed both, which I thought was quite funny. I didn't get any jokes from the OED, but uh, <laughs> I thought it was quite a nice uh, uh, ambivalent. Um, so the critique of the smart city hype as fantasy seems to depend precisely on such a notion of the imagination. The imagination of the corporate smart city marketeer is understood as far too little engaged with the realities of the external world. And although, of course, the production uh, of glossy brochures and glittering websites and dazzling Twitter feeds is in fact a highly materialized practice, which depends on a very elaborate, uh, globalized division of labor, nonetheless, it's seen as, as not really uh, kind of of the world. Um, similarly, um, uh, it's too interior, uh, too distant, and it doesn't produce uh, talk, text, or images that sufficiently engage with, uh, with the real. Uh, Shannon Matten has discussed uh, another implication of this critical move. Uh, 
So rather like the uh, response from a lot of A&T scholarships to the emergence of the smart city, Matten points out that much arts-based criticism of digital urbanism uh, has also has turned to uh, various forms of what purport to be description rather than imagination in order to um, challenge the corporate excesses uh, of, of these runaway uh, imagined. So if you, there's too much crazy dreaming going on, well, the one response is to, to, to get real uh, and go descriptive. So here's one project by Timo Arnold that visualises the strength of a Wi-Fi signal through, uh, through an urban space. Uh, and there was another exhibition, uh, I mean, there are many, many of them, um, one uh, in London in November by uh, Tactical Tech, which is a Berlin-based uh, critical digital uh, arts practice, which was all about simply showing you what smart was, to the extent was that many of the exhibits were simply adverts for smart apps being screened. Because somehow, while smart is also invisible and we need imagination to see it, it kind of also apparently is, is exposing <coughs> itself. It, it, it kind of gives itself away, if you like, if only we could look at it properly. So if humans have both too much uh, and too little imagination then, uh, you know, imagination is clearly this kind of problem thing, uh, it's clear that in many definitions of smart and justifications of smart city, one of its valuable qualities apparently is that it entirely lacks any kind of imagination. Uh, so one of the, the, the sort of founding uh, manifestos uh, of big data and, and, it, and its usefulness uh, was the notorious uh, uh, editorial in Wired magazine in 2008, which argued precisely that with big data and machine learning, AI, there was no need for any kind of human intervention. Big data could simply be analysed by the machines and the machines would then fix, fix the problems for us. Um, and indeed, you know, if you go on through the, the critical literature, uh, while the smart city is occasionally understood as a body, uh, so we have uh, arguments about data being its lifeblood, um, about the boundaries of the body being the boundaries of, of, of its uh, uh, technical models that it depends on, about data being its lifeblood. I mean, interesting, there are lots of corporealized imagery going on about smart. Uh, it's always insisted that um, smart lacks imagination, even if you think of it as, as embodied. It's a Frankenstein, to quote the title of a recent paper in Society in Space. It's a patched together body parts that have, uh, uh, have no consciousness, and this seems to be something that has to be uh, insisted on. And then, of course, many of you know the work of, um, uh, of Armin and Thrift, uh, um, uh, who uh, have been arguing for some time now that smart and digitally saturated urban environments are affected, which is another way in which human imagination, reinvention, thought is, is kind of bypassed by the, uh, the affect this time of these uh, uh, data-driven uh, urban spaces. Uh, so uh, what to do then in the face of this, and at this point I'm quite glad I probably only have about a minute left because I think it's quite a challenging, challenging question to think about uh, if the imagination, if the act of imagining is being framed in these ways as, as kind of basically a problem in relation to smart, how then do we respond? And I think one way not to respond is simply say, well, we need more imagination. I think we need to think about diversifying and complexifying our understanding of what the imagination might be. So I think for a start, we certainly need to think about the imagination, the imaginary was always technically mediated. And we have plenty of conceptual tools to do that. You know, the, the imagination is not something that's distinctively human. It's not something that just goes on up here. It's something that always needs tools and technologies to be articulated, to be produced, to be shared, to be distributed, to be archived, to be destroyed. It's profoundly material. Uh, and it needs to be thought in, in that kind of context, to be materialized. And secondly, I think we could think about who's imagining and diverse kinds of imagining that might happen. So smart is a term that was patented by IBM years ago. So we're struck with smart is a kind of very American term for thinking about what is intelligent. Uh, Iona Data has a great paper out um, uh, right now talking about smart instead from the way that smart city um, po po uh, policymakers in India uh, also talk about smart. She talks about the chatur citizen, not the smart citizen, but the chatur citizen, I hope I'm pronouncing it properly, who is somebody who's kind of street streetwise, canny, networked. Uh, can survive, I get this, but could make a connection back to um, di different sorts of, of, of intelligence that's not simply about being the fastest, the most efficient, the most rational, the most machine driven. And that's maybe another way in which we can multiply uh, and contextualise and situate diverse forms of imagination rather than finding, being boxed into this discourse that, that imagination is, is, is a problem that we somehow need to avoid. Thank you.
Rivers of Oxford, and I think she had a lot of imagination because she's also an novelist. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. It's just the last one. Yeah. For, oh, that's the one for I the PowerPoint. Okay. I did know PowerPoint. Oh, okay. So just, just the imagination. Just all of your imagination. <laughs> Is that too dark at the back then? We can have the lights all on, actually. That's what I'm trying to do. But. <laughs> 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 okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I think there's probably. It was my slight concern, as it often is, as a, a literature scholar um, appearing at a, at a non-literature social sciences conference, that um, there's, you know, the, the, where, where's the traction between um, our different areas of work? But I think there's, in fact, quite quite a lot of traction uh, between our papers on certainly on this panel. Um, what I talk about implicitly anyway is um, how um, the literary imagination or um, our work as readers of imaginative texts, how that creates porosity across um, city divisions, city boundaries. Um, and then I, I suppose in relation to Gillian's paper that we just heard, I'm interested in how literature might be seen as a technology of the urban imagine, imagination, of the of urban imaginaries. The work that I'm speaking to today comes out of a project that I have been involved with for a number of years. It has had several incarnations, basically several sort of generations of funding. Um, called the project is called uh, Planned Violence. Post-colonial urban infrastructures and literature. We were based in um, five different institutions across three continents: uh, Oxford, London, Delhi, and Johannesburg. And what we were interested in doing through a series of workshops, which have now come to an end, and we're now putting together the um, the essay collection rising out of those those workshops. What we were all interested in doing was looking at how reading, um, the imaginative reception stimulated, generated, and guided by reading, um, and also by other, by other works of art, including film, how that allows us to move through the city, to interrogate its boundaries, to create a kind of porosity. So, we were interested, and in, in my work or my contribution to the project in particular, we were interested in how literature imagines the city, if you like, image maps the city, allows us to imagine our own cities, to create new possibilities, different ways of inhabiting the city, in particular, strongly divided cities. And what I'd like to do in the time that I have is to pick up on a number of examples, literary examples, and then to talk a little bit about the how we might theorize these examples or how these particular literatures might contribute to um, imagining, image mapping the city. So I'd like to begin by drawing our attention to um, Omar Robert Hamilton's The City Always Wins. And, and, he, and here's, here, here's a quote from, uh, from that work. Um, it, is, it is set during the 2011 uprising in around Tahrir Square in Cairo. <coughs> Cairo is all jazz, all contrapuntal influence jostling for attention, occasionally brilliant solos standing high above the steady rhythm of the street. These streets laid out to echo the order and ratio and martial management of the modern city now molded by the tireless rhythms of salesmen and hawkers and car horns and gas peddlers all out in the ownership of their city, mixing pasts with their presence, birthing a new now of south and north, young and old, country and city all combining and coming out loud and brash and with a beauty incomprehensible. Yes, Cairo is jazz. Now you might notice how that short extract that, that, that I read there and, the, and the, the, the narrative very much continues in that mode. You may notice how 
the, the words, the lines weave a jazz rhythm across city space, mimicking something of the spontaneous effects and outbursts of energy of everyday life as they play out over the underlying urban infrastructures that, quote from the piece, order and ratio and marshal city space. Franz Fanon, we uh, remember, uh, described in his account of the colonial city, a world divided into compartments that relies on lines of force that bring violence into the home and into the mind of the native. So according to Fanon, where urban planning in Algiers, as in Cairo and other colonial cities of that time, the 1950s, was a violent materialization of colonialism's exploitative project. It was a planned violence. But then notice against this, against those lines of force that Fanon described, how, how uh, Robert Omar Hamilton points to countervailing aspects, reimaginings beyond and through and with, utilizing those lines of force, but also going beyond them, exploding them through the interventions of ordinary people through activating the tireless rhythms of salesmen and hawkers and car horns and gas peddlers all out in their ownership of the city. What this mobilizes, I think, and this is something that our project uh, closely investigated, is how people and, pe and community interactions can become a kind of informal urban infrastructure, um, reminding us of um, Abu Malik Simone's notion of people as infrastructure. Residents, or indeed citizens, all of whom have imagination, um, who interact with cultural products, including literary writing, including artworks, can enact through those artworks, through their imaginative engagement with them, a repossession of urban space. I was very interested in what we were hearing there about the community center in the favela in, in Rio. So enact a, a repossession of urban space, or what Lefebvre would describe as a right to the city. Th these rights can be claimed through imaginative work, through the kinetic, oral, and visual occupation of urban space. The writer, the artist, exercises a shaping power over processes of urbanization insisting upon a participatory role in the ways in which our cities are made and imaginatively remade. It is in this imaginative occupation, engagement with urban space, or what Judith Butler calls bodies in alliance, that the imaginative reconfiguration of urban spaces and modes of city living can be regenerated. And I believe that literary writing plays an important role in this reconfiguration. Indeed, I'd want to claim, and we will do so in the, in, the, in the book that I already referred to that will be called Planned Violence, I'd want to claim that literary structures can set up a powerful counterpoint to the planned violence of the city, an imaginative and imaginary counterpoint. So to give you a few more examples, this one not particularly concerned as, as um, the, the Hamilton uh, novel was um, with um, with revolutionary urban movements, but concerned with ne neoliberal capital, um, the, the, the kind of the explosion of capital that, that Delhi has seen in recent years, uh, Rana Dasgupta's Capital 2014. It's a love-hate song to Delhi and its singular brand of modernity, ribald, brutal, cacophonous, exhilarating. He too, or this text too, similarly represents the city as a place of embedded inequalities through its non-fictional yet literary form. For Dasgupta and Capital, the city's divisions and layerings are cross-hatched. Again, there's this sort of this, this, these tropes, these metaphors of cross-hatching, as in the Hamilton. The city's divisions are cross-hatched, made porous, if you like, with a globalized mass culture born of po post-colonial conflict, in the case of this work, the 1947 partition. But meanwhile, interstitial su subcultures work to re-elaborate and reconstruct streets, markets, and other spaces in ways that involve the city dwellers themselves. So in the book, in this 
memoir stroke travelogue through Delhi, Das Gupta is constantly interacting with the city dwellers themselves, asking them what they think about inhabiting the city space. Imitating Rana Das Gupta's own movement through the city, his narrative's mostly untitled chapters rocket the reader through a series of formative post-1991 Delhi experiences, from outsourcing and Americanization to corruption and the accumulation of waste. Chapters that dwell on formative moments in the city's history are themselves threaded through with the author's conversations with prototypical Delhiites, engaging varyingly a spectrum of violent, corrupt, and activist projects. By interspersing his movement through and stoppages in Delhi's clogged motorway system with the individual stories of his interviewees, Das Gupta's own writing sets about remapping the city's chaotic street infrastructure, while at the same time plotting intrepid individual routes through it and spaces within it. As indeed does, interestingly, Arundhati Roy's most recent novel, 2017, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. For those of you who may know that this novel, you will remember that um, the Hijra Anjum's home in New Delhi is in a graveyard. What she what she does is um, is to is to go to the one place in the city that is um, free of those lines of restrictive force that Fanon was talking about, namely the graveyard. And here she creates a kind of village, an alternative community. Um, she opens up perhaps the most unpromising of city spaces, the graveyard, the most dead, literally, and she makes of it a living, thriving, and interactive place. And what the novel does is it keeps t returning us to that space. It's the, it's, the, it's the space where the various waifs and strays, who are the, the main characters, come, come together, accumulate over time. And not only human waifs and strays, but also animals. Just a very quick e extract. Between Zainab and Saddam, they had turned the graveyard into a zoo, a Noah's Ark of injured animals. There was a young peacock who could not fly, and a peahen, perhaps his mother, who would not leave him. There were three old cows that slept all day. Zainab arrived one day in an auto rickshaw with several cages stuffed with three dozen budgies that had been absurdly colored in luminous dyes. She had bought them in a fit of anger from a bird seller who had the cages stacked on the back of his bicycle and so on. So the lines of flight, or the, 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 the walking lines of these animals, these waves and strays, and the human characters create a very interesting, um, fertile, imaginative zone within the very heart of the novel, but also within the heart of Delhi that is being represented. Or to take yet another example again, going to a very different space, Amanata Fauna's The Memory of Love, a novel about the 1990s civil war in Sierra Leone and its aftermath, recalls how the fearsome rebel army, the Revolutionary United Front, swept through the capital Freetown, targeting and destroying with overwhelming violence the infrastructure of city streets, bridges, and government buildings. In the novel, in this, in, which is set in the war's aftermath, the city becomes, for the key characters like like Kai, Fauna's, one of Fauna's main protagonists, punctuated by painful no-go areas, the conflict lingers in these spaces, embedded in its subjective psychogeography. Yet, even while the novel charts these personal maps of urban trauma, at the same time, the fast-moving prose explores other life-affirming through routes that the man characters have managed to carve through the city in, in, in spite of and against this prevailing violence. Now I have a number of other um, examples that I personally am very excited about to demonstrate the, the ways in which these alternative lines of imaginative force are created through these writings um, in, in the, um, and, and across the divided spaces of the city. A number of fantastic examples from Johannesburg also, which was one of the places that our project concentrated on We've looked at Marco Visser's Dispatcher. We've looked at uh, Ivan Vladislavich's uh, Portrait with Keys. We've also looked at some London novels, including Harare North and 
Monica Ali's Brick Lane. But I'd just like to, in the interest of time, just skip to the end um, to say something about, if you like, the technologies of this literature. I mean, how, how it does this, this, um, this imaginative work that I'm suggesting it does, how it retraces, renegotiates um, the spaces of the city. Because, of course, these works need to be read, to be mobilized. The, for these imaginaries to be mobilized, these works need to be read. Um, so there is something quite crucial about um, the cognitive processes that are activated in the reader by these books, which in a longer version of this paper I would, I would want to say more about. There's also an important way in which for the reader these works mobilize um, hope, mobilize a, a utopian imaginary, if you like. And um, just, to, uh, just to kind of pinpoint that, a quote from um, the post-colonial critic Bill Ashcroft when he talks about the utility of utopia in literature, um, which lies in, in the capacity of literature to imagine a different world. Whether there's any political instrumentality in, in utopian thinking is the same question as the one that arises in all arguments about the book or the barricade. Can literature change the world? Well, only if it is read, right? But, but, but when it is read, it is that interesting question, which perhaps we can talk about in, in the questions, um, when it is read, what, what, what is it about this writing that, that creates these alternative imaginaries? Perhaps it creates those less than smart, um, kind of do-it-yourself imaginaries um, that, that through which we can re-inhabit city space. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. I have some further lines on utopian thinking, but I, I think I'd like to leave it there. I will, I would, I'll simply just read from um, Sarah Nuttall, who has written the afterword to our, the, the book Planned Violence, where she writes that the infrastructures of our places and our times are sites of violence, planned and unplanned, but also modes of reopening, of repair and reoccupation. In all these ways, these books, these literary writings, demand our attention and provide an occasion for rethinking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Even though I, I'm sure we're all getting hungry, I could stay in this panel for another hour or more because it's so interesting and there's so much to unpack, but um, I will be quick, uh, just make a few remarks. I liked very much the discussion and I think this is a beautiful discussion whether it's more it me like imagination and consciousness and also how literature can uh, function as a, as a technology and the role of this utopia, the utility of utopia in, in the city. And uh, I won't make a direct question, but those are points that really stick to, to me now. But I have a question more directly to Sandra. And you mentioned some, some I, I think more directly the example of a girl who lives in a favela and doesn't want to go to Recreio, Barra da Tijuca, some upper class space in Rio. Um, and I was thinking, or, or middle class, middle class, yeah, middle class. And I was thinking about other movements as well when uh, people from um, the peripheries of cities in Brazil occupied shopping malls and connecting also with uh, Caldera's uh, presentation, but this is a previous, another presentation, when she talked about these colazinhos and there is always this issue of when you know, this division between class that creates more resistance or this resignation and people just avoid or confront. Um, yes, I think th you, this is exactly the most central question, you know, how do you move from the subjective experience of that young girl and her initial attempts to understand herself in relation <coughs> to other people who are going to be absolutely determinant to the, for her developing sense of identity and who she is with 
strategies being built in her community to get out and explore precisely those aspects of herself that she cannot see yet, but which are there. And that's why I think we need to have, and that's my plea in a way, and that's what we try to bring with a psychosocial approach, that there is a mind space in the city that cannot be out uh, of the debate <coughs> because ultimately you need individuals who are able to understand themselves as agents and who can then produce the kind of collective agency that we have observed in organizations such as Aparegui or Kufa or as it is a uh, described in her work, what is the holezinho in Rio? You know, what does it take for a boy from a favela or for a bunch of black boys from the favelas to go to a shopping center in Ipanema and start to display the way they do music, their bodies, their existence? Just occupying that space is an act of resistance, rebellion, and at the same time, a disruption of the geography of the city and of the psychology of the city. Because I have heard, I mean, in Brazil, we have been experiencing tremendous processes of social change. But if you walk into a middle, upper middle class of town, any town, I'm thinking of Porto Alegre, I'm thinking of Rio, I'm thinking of Sao Paulo, you're going to hear people say, well, now that everyone can come into the shopping center, we, the as pessoas is the expression, which is, we the persons don't have anything to shop. Or, you know, the way the middle classes, the upper classes have felt disruption because of the occupation of Rolazinho or just the lifting of people out of poverty. So I see that there is a deep connection between the voices of young favela children who are in the process of defining who they are and what they want to be, and those experiences of agency that have actually sprung from the favelas in the form of these organizations that are actually struggling right now in Brazil to, sus to be sustainable, but which represent a move towards a new form of activism that is proud not only of its own capabilities at community level, but it's very determined to state who they are and what is the identity they want as opposed to the identity they are given by others in the wider public sphere. So that is the process, I think, that we need to problematize. How do you move from her voice to a collective voice of empowerment and transformation that will feed back into her own individual pathway as she grows up and as she develops as a citizen of the city, as they said to me. You know, I want to be a citizen of Rio de Janeiro. And I heard from many people in the favelas, I don't want to speak favelas, I want to speak Portuguese. I want to speak Portuguese, you know, which rhymes in a nice way. Mm, so <coughs> I guess my question, my question is for Sandra. Um, and it kind of extends from what you just said. Uh, what came to mind during your presentation was the gang leader who kidnapped the nurses um, to make sure that people in the favela would get shots for yellow fever. And I'm um, thinking about borders, thinking about this young girl thinking that she can't leave, but now there's this person who is kind of in, in, a, in an empowering way, like we are gonna bring the resources that we do not have access to, right? But then does that then thicken those borders in the mind? Does it enforce that? Or does it say that we have power even though we're in the favela and we leave, we can still bring those resources back? I'm just curious how, what that did to the imagination of, of a youth in your opinion. I think that's a very good question. Is that the problem are the limits of this kind of intervention, and I think we are in Rio in a way we're starting to experiencing and witness the limits of you can't stay only at the level of the bottom up. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things I observed in Brazil or since 2009, 2008, when I started to work there, were the, the level of 
partnerships that were being established between the state, NGOs, social movements, not least because if you want to get into a favela, as you saw, for us to get into Vigara Geral, you need to negotiate entrance with an African, so you need, the state needs to do the same thing, so you need to find strategies, and you need to partner effectively with marginalized populations to get in the most basic uh, health services, such as yellow fever shots. So, you know, you need those levels of informality, but I am convinced that ultimately we will need to bring institutionality to favela territories, and how this is going to be done is a problem I leave to my urbanist colleagues, because I, you know, the complexity is so huge, and there are so many dangers involved in that interaction that I don't even like to think of when it comes to subaltern dispossessed peoples and how you know, I was very struck this morning when Teresa mentioned that, you know, we're moving from possession of land to rental of land that is being actually acquired by militias, by illegal organizations in Sao Paulo. I don't, to my knowledge, this is not happening as yet in the prime areas of Rio, Rocinha, Cantagalo, which are right in the middle of town and have the best views of, of the city. But I, you know, I shrink just to think what is going to happen when real estate developers discover that the best views to have in Rio are actually if you go up to Cantagalo, you know, and why should those populations be living there? So I would, you know, your question is incredibly difficult one to, to answer. And I think that uh, at the moment, most of the communities, what they have is this guy who goes and kidnaps a nurse or, and that's why so many of the drug organizations that operate in favelas can stay in that territory. Because as Fijão in the film you saw when uh, Washington Rivers, who's Fijão, the, 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 the guy who is an activist in the favela said, in the favela I learned my values and my known values. Mm -hmm. Because he said, when you talk to him, you know, when I was growing up, the guys who did the good in my community were the narcotraffic bosses. And he became one, because that's what he wanted to be. You know, and took him a whole different uh, set of experiences to change his mind and to change his life trajectory, which he did. And today he's an activist working and making sure that other kids don't experience what he did. But you know, you need to have the kidnapping of the nurse because when you need the yellow shots, you need the yellow shots. And communities, humans will act when they have to. But that's not a sustainable solution for favela territories. We need to act and change that. Final question, yeah, just, I'm sorry, it's back in on Brazil, but could, just I'm just I don't, I don't, could you just tell me a bit about the, which side of the border Capoeira is on? I don't know much about it, but I heard of it. And well, Capoeira is everywhere in Brazil. It's a form of martial art that came to Brazil with the black populations that were transported to the country by slavery. And uh, it's in the favelas, capoeira, the beat of the drums, what favela dwellers and we Brazilians call a batida, the specific beat that communities have. So it's the music, is the, is the beat, is the dance. Is, capoeira is a form of dance. It's a very dance-like, swingy-like. So this is all part of the African matrix of Brazilian culture absolutely central for favela communities in relation to the imagination, because they rely on the imagination to survive. You know, the imagination is a major asset of these communities, and it's expressed in everyday life in the telling of stories, which go back to a mixture of the quilombos of the old stories of Brazilian survival and struggle, of black survival and struggle in Brazil, but also to experiences such as you know, Martin Luther King and other figures of, of the black movement. So capoeira is in and out, as most things in Brazil, but it's very much as Brazilian popular music, something that comes from the hill. It's part of the culture of the hill, cultura do morro. And it comes down to the asphalt, because it's seen as cool, because you know young people love it, and they want to do it. It's very popular in Europe as well. Thank you. Uh, 
Let me go back to the question of porosity, not only in Rio or Sao Paulo, but maybe in literature or in other cities. Um, I think that one of the main imaginaries about the modern city is that it pours, right? So that uh, is the idea that if you're in a modern city, you can walk around, you can be anonymous, you can go everywhere, and you can, uh, and that's, that's the definition of it. If you know, there's that famous article by Iris Marion Young in which she mm -hmm. thinks about democracy by thinking about what is to circulate in a, in a big city. So if this is what, if porosity is what defines the city, why, uh, so isn't your problem not porosity, but exactly its opposite? So it's, uh, so it's not that, the problem is that you create those zones of no pass, and that those zones basically fragment and destroy the modern city. And so that's the, the issue is not to think uh, of porosity, but exactly of the opposite. So the problem is not porosity, the problem is the opposite, is the problem that it was destroyed. Thank you, all, all three of you, for your wonderful papers. I think the urban imaginary is in, in great hands. I wanted to say a thing about Twitter and a thing about novels, because uh, mm -hmm. I love both. Jill, as you were speaking, I tweeted Shannon Matten. I just said mm. that you were talking about soja to Shannon Matten, and she liked it straight away, so I felt all excited about <laughs> the incipient feminist critique of the smart city, and that's my question about that. Do you... So we had a very uh, robust critique of the smart city from Eric in the previous session. Do you, s like Sharon Matter and others, do you see that as an overtly feminist project? Um, is there, is there, a, is there a, what's the gender dimension of smart city, if that's okay? And the other one, uh, I also love novels so much and novels about place that I'm just reflecting on the fact that I can't quite remember the places that I've been and the places I haven't at this point. So, the, you know, that, that period where there was all the wonderful Indian novels and Indian mystery and all those, and I studied South Asian literature as an undergraduate, and I can't remember if I've been or not, and I wondered about that, the sense of an imaginary. And then also the sense that you never go fresh to places because of the intertext, you know, structured around your idea about, um, so, you know, like, again, um, you know, the Prague novels and even Chima and, um, and how far place in that sense is, is the city a text or is it an intertext, I guess, is what I'm wondering. So I think everybody's provoked, so <laughs> we can pass the microphone and answer in a rough pamphlet, and then we'll ask school first. Okay, but thank you for the question. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the, the smart city project. So if, is there a feminist critique of the smart city? Well, you, well, you bet. And uh, <laughs> uh, Shannon Matter and Ian Daphne, you know, there are a number of that, is that work beginning to emerge, a sort of intersectional critique as well. Um, I mean, certainly in the UK, uh, with the emphasis, I mean, it, that's, this comes back to the question about porosity, which is one of the, the, one of the few things that every risky comment, you know, every city, almost every smart city focuses on. Uh, there's a lot of diversity within that label, but, but transport and, and smooth, flowing, problem-free, automatic, sometimes green electrical transport is, is absolutely what defines the smart city. And one of the aims of the smart city is, so one of the, when, when you look at all the promotional videos, one of the problems it's picked is people waiting. So I, I'm not sure whether porosity flow actually, we can say, one is good and one is bad. I think it depends very much on, on context, actually. Um, so, uh, but certainly, uh, it seems to me that that transport is focused very much, that, that flow is focused very much on, on time-saving efficiencies, and with particular gender divisions of labour, that, that's a particular matter in this view of, I think, what the city is. So, driverless cars, they're never pictured, I mean, my, my ideal driverless car would be one that pulls up outside the supermarket, and you've got <laughs> ten bags shopping, and a toddler, and a screaming baby, and it would just open the door, and magically, it will whisk you home. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Strangely, that is not what they pictured there. <laughs> smart people in suits doing reading the economists while they're sitting in their automatic versions of their already car, you know, it's very, you know, so there are all sorts of gendered priorities. 
uh, partly because the IT sector in the UK at least is very male dominated. That's not true elsewhere. India, for example, I think there are more women in the IT sector, so you know, that, that might well be you know, noted for something. Um, but one thing, maybe this is to segue into mm. something around literature. So I think there are some other registers of critique though as well. What I didn't say was that I think if we're trying to think about imaginations as being mediated through technologies of many kinds, um, I think we might also think about some technologies having their own imaginations mm. and speculative fiction uh, in terms of distributing agency across all sorts of bodies and agencies and relations and multiplications. And that was the last I hear in Trey's uh, lecture this morning. Uh, I was, uh, my, my particular citation was um, uh, Anne Leckie, who's a speculative fiction writer. She has a book where you realise about three chapters in that the narrator is not, not human as we recognise it. It's absolutely brilliant revelation. And I, 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 it helped me think differently about the difficult. Not just in terms of gender, but about multiple you know, subjectivities more generally having to be rethought. Um, yeah. Wanted to m maybe just a, a, a response on on gender too. Actually, that um, I mean, maybe I'm just sort of saying the same thing. But but it's, it has always struck me that urban porosity is is um, is always by definition a, a masculine porosity. I mean that the movement of um, you know, a human being that through city space is, you know, depends on um, that person being safe, you know, and and, 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 and and not being threatened. It depends on daylight for a, for a, for a woman. It depends on absolutely on daylight. And what what is so interesting, for example, about and there's many other examples about the Arundhati Roy, is that she is that her her. Key characters are either transvestites or women, and you know you, they they negotiate city space differently. So what literature also allows us to do, I think, is not, it's it's the representational thing. Absolutely, you know, I've had that experience. I'm sure everyone else has of going to New York for the first time <laughs> and thinking, I've been here before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but 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 you know what what literature also does is not only speculative fiction, actually, although oh, that, that 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 does you know a, a very important thing, but but it's. It's that way in which um, um, you know, Roy in this in this novel opens up tiny, confined, polluted, restrictive areas of the city, and sort of, and gives them a, you know, a crowded, a teeming, a very vital life force simply by you know imagining through her writing uh, different ways of being in those spaces, and that's what I find particularly exciting uh, about this work. Um, it has to kind of operate together with, of course, because you know the novel is such a kind of a, a bourgeois genre. You know, it has to operate with other kinds of um, art forms like dance, like music. Um, but I think it, 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 because it's a technology of imagination, it works in particular. Which is <laughs> well, so I, you know, I agree that uh, to address uh, Teresa's point, I agree that. Uh, you know, the fundamental imagination and perhaps reality underpinning the city is the idea of ferocity, of encounters, of, you know, I think that you could put the, the, the young girl I was uh, presenting to you here at one side of the extreme and the flaneur or the flaneuse at the other side, because the experience of walking the city, of navigating the city, we all know that pleasure, we all experience that pleasure, and we all know as well that in some towns you don't go to certain places. You have to be very careful. There is a passive knowledge, there is a representation of certain areas of London, for instance, where I know I should go, I should not go. There are post, uh, there are postcode gang wars. Uh, in, in some cities of the world, I think this is so acute and so extreme that to restate the problem of ferocity today is almost a political act that we need to engage in because although our imagination builds cities to be porous and to enable us to communicate and build our lives together, today they are so divided and they are so inhabited by territories of poverty, exclusion, and marginalization that many of the citizens are completely excluded from that experience of being in the city. So for many of the people in Vigarra Geral, life is confined to Vigarra Geral. They have never been to the, to the beach. They have never been to Ipaminha, for instance, or to Copacabana. They have never experienced the sea, and they live in Rio. So that's my, I think, 
Yes, I think the problem is back in the agenda, and it will be in the agenda as long as we have the city of walls that you so aptly <laughs> described. Thank you very much. So this was an amazing panel. <laughs>